Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Benavot. Here in Korea, I will be known as Benavot Aaron. And I'm delighted to moderate this uh, second session. I'd like to welcome all the people that are joining us online and also those here in the room. We had a very dynamic first session. I'd like to thank the moderator and the panelists for getting us started. And we hope to continue uh, that energy in this second session. The title of which is Global Citizenship Education Competences as Transformative Learning for Critical Empowerment. Now, before we get started, two very quick announcements. First, if you would like to have the most up-to-date version of the program, as you will see on your tables, there's a QR uh, code. And if you point your phone at the QR code, you will uh, hopefully be able to upload the most up-to-date version of the two-day conference. And secondly, uh, as we did in the first session, we will have time for uh, questions and answers. For those uh, folks that are here in the uh, auditorium, you will have uh, papers on your tables. Please write either in English or Korean your questions. Uh, and for those that are joining us online, I believe you can add your questions to the chat box. So with that, uh, let me just say uh, two words as an introduction to this se uh, session. Um, as you may note in the title uh, of the session in the program, the word competences, the word global citizenship competences has quotes around it. And in many ways, that really is the focus of attention. Also picking up the comment, uh, the theme of the conference, which is unpacking, G said, which means to dissemble it or to deconstruct it or to kind of uh, think about it in, in different ways and then think about potentially reassembling or reconstructing it. So um, I, I would say that uh, uh, speaking as both a, um, uh, speaking as a, somebody who's been involved in cross-national and comparative research in this area and in other related areas, often when we have a concept, there are really two different levels of the concept that we could uh, begin to unpack. One is to think about the concept from a conceptual level, to think about what are the different components, what are the different dimensions, how might we uh, uh, understand the different aspects. Uh, and another way is to think about the concept from a more empirical or operational level, which is were we to do, uh, conduct research how would we go about taking the concept and beginning to operationalize it in ways that we can ask questions of uh, the various target audiences? And um, one of the things that you would see in doing a little bit of a, a literature review around the idea of global citizenship education competences is that there is no consensus conceptual definition or operational definition. There are many different ways and approaches that people take to understand the various elements uh, that one could uh, presume to include under the idea of global citizenship education. And um, maybe just to take this one step further, and then I would like to introduce the panelist. One way to think about this would be to say, let's begin with a definition to think about its components and then think about how to contextualize it in many different settings around the world or even within countries. Another way is to approach this from the bottom up and that would be to ask people, whether they be young people or uh, old people, how they understand certain aspects that you think of as being important or to include in a a definition of global citizenship and see what emerges from their responses. And you might get very different types of uh, results. 
So partly uh, we have a very distinguished group of uh, three uh, very experienced uh, researchers, scholars who have been working in this area. I'm delighted uh, to introduce our first speaker, Professor Esther Kerr, who works both with governmental and non-governmental organizations on education reform with a focus on 21st century skills and assessment. She's been coordinating a new indicator for Target 4.7, and she's been working with EPSAU, the Asia Pacific Center uh, for Education uh, of International Understanding on Global Citizenship Education here in Asia. She's, uh, in the last few years, been working with colleagues in Africa in a project called Alive that uh, various uh, colleagues in East Africa have been developing an assessment of life skills in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. And her career spans more than 20 years at the University of Melbourne, where she's currently a uh, professorial scholar. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So without further ado, she'll be speaking here about, and let me just make sure I get this, a generic model and its blockers. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Aaron, and good afternoon, everybody, and good afternoon to those of you who are not in the room. What I'm going to say today has been stimulated by some work that I've been doing recently where it's become very clear to me that there are many countries looking to reform curricula or to revise curricula and to take into consideration lots of different priorities. And some of those countries have been finding it difficult to bring the different priorities together. And so that's really made me start thinking a lot about how do we manage to integrate many new priorities into education systems. So typically when we look to design programs and to monitor them, we look at the end goals. We look at what we want to achieve. And then we work back from those end goals in a backwards design process to think about what we need to put into place in order to achieve those goals. Now, that means that achievement is measured against that end goal or outcome rather than looking at the contributing components. And what I'm suggesting or what I'm considering is that maybe we should be looking instead at measuring the outputs, i.e. the outputs that come before those big outcomes, before those goals. And what is the reason for that? The reason is that when we look at lots of different new priorities, when we look at them analytically, they contain a lot of the same components. And so I wonder whether it might not be better to focus on those components rather than to focus on that end goal. So here I hope in a moment, or maybe not, yes. So three issues. I'm aware there's lots more than three issues, but three issues will do for now. These are some of the issues that confront these education systems when they're looking to revise and review their curricular frameworks. And if they're looking at global citizenship, an immediate question goes to Aaron's point about definition. What does global citizenship mean? Then they need to think about, do I want to adopt it? And then they're faced with lots of competing priorities which might be set by their national government systems and think about how do they bring all those together? And so examples of different priorities. So not only do we have global citizenship, we have sustainable development, the concept of global competency, climate change, and of course, we're talking about transformative education, which might be an umbrella or it might not be. And so we need to be thinking about how does an education system or a country think about bringing these together? Two quick examples. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with uh, Bhutan for a very short time um, with APSEU, and I saw them looking to accommodate their gross national happiness concept 
global citizenship and values education. If I look at a country like Uganda, they're trying to bring together um, generic competencies, life skills, values, as well as other cross-cutting issues like environmental awareness, health awareness, citizenship, life skills, and so on. So how are countries meant to bring all these together when they're looked at as separate goals? Is there another way of looking at it? And so I'd like to talk about this, which I'm sure is familiar to many of you. This was the 2016 draft model for global competency. And it's not detailed, but it takes a nice holistic perspective that you bring together knowledge, skills, attitudes and values, and that when you bring those together, you form competencies, and that if you have those competencies, you're then able to take action. So it's a very nice logical model. And what we need to be thinking about is, can we combine a lot of these specific goals, the contributing components to them, in a way that fulfills each of those big targets, but maximises the efficiency of looking at the contributing elements. So each of those goals are movements in their own right, but they have a lot in common. So there might be lots of ways of looking at this. This is a quick way. We've got traditional education and typically we have most valued knowledge. That's not to say that we haven't valued the other things, but typically knowledge content has been the big thing. We've got global citizenship. We know it rests on knowledge, skills, attitudes and values. Climate change education. It rests on the same three areas. Transformative education, whatever that might be, obviously also values the skills, the attitudes and the values. So each of those goals or movements has a great deal in common and they all require what I would term 21st century skills or here in Asia, East Asia, we might call transversal competencies more typically. And so what's interesting to think about is can we focus on those transversal competencies seeing them as enabling characteristics that will combine to produce the outcomes in which we are interested in terms of the labelling of these different systems. So on the right hand side here you can see global citizenship, sustainable development, the global competency, climate change. With those enabling characteristics predicting or contributing to each of those. Obviously, each of those has knowledge or content knowledge varying across them, but we've got this very strong core group of competencies that all contribute to these same particular outcomes that we value. And so what I'm saying here is maybe we should be focusing on those outputs as our goals rather than the specific labels that we're attributing to the movements in education. So when I talk about the enabling characteristics, what am I talking about? What you can see here in front of you is one conceptualization of this. As with any of these ideas, it's going to vary across country, it's going to vary across region. And so this particular word cloud is an assembly of the life skills, generic competencies, whatever you might want to call them, coming out of Kenya and Tanzania and Uganda. So we have the core competencies and we also have values and attitudes that are also common across the countries. So this particular assembly of competencies or characteristics is just assembled from all their curricular frameworks. So all of these, if you look at them, they make sense in terms of a global citizenship contribution. And if we come back, however, back to the education systems, anybody here can look at this and think, well, that looks awfully confusing. That's 
that's too much. We're just as complicated here as we are looking at each of the labelled outcomes. But we can look at this in different ways. We can bring it down, for example, just to the core competencies themselves across these three countries. So you can see very similar or very familiar areas like cooperation, critical thinking, creative thinking, problem solving. And we've already heard today quite a bit about problem solving and critical thinking. So these sorts of TVC, transversal competencies, as I said, you'll get slightly different groupings of them across different countries or regions, but there's definitely a core grouping there that I think most of us would recognise. And so if we think about bringing those together, then we need to think about how can you implement into curriculum? And I know that we're going to have some sessions, I think, tomorrow on pedagogy as well, which maybe will bring this out. But this is sort of going to the second point of what I want to talk about, which is we're thinking about deconstructing or making more simple the concept of global citizenship. But we're also thinking about how do you bring that into an education system in a way that teachers will be able to work with? And so what I've been reflecting about is we need to think about what the notion of a global citizen is. A global citizen is somebody who takes action, is one of the points that makes most sense to me. And so if we're seeing global citizens as people who have integrated all the competencies, attitudes and values that we see as aligned with the concept, then hopefully they're going to take some action about it. And already we heard this morning, both from um, Director Lim and then later from Professor Lee about urgency for action, about let's get something moving. So it seems to me we really need to focus on that when we're talking about integration into pedagogy. And what that means is modelling. It's modelling of behaviours. It's not direct instruction. So it's no good any of us saying to students in a room, you should dot, dot, dot. Saying that is not engaging. It doesn't give a reason for it. It's merely another older person saying to a younger person that I know better than you. And that's not going to get anywhere. So what we need is for teachers to be modelling the behaviours. So that's the first point that I want to make about the implication of a focus on transversal competencies for enabling global citizenship. The second part is to look at some of those competencies or characteristics and, using Aaron's words, deconstruct them. That's particularly easy if we think about notions of critical thinking or problem solving because we know we can deconstruct those constructs into series of steps. And we also know that we can teach those steps. And that if we teach those steps across different subject areas in different levels of teaching, the concept will be generalised such that the students should be able to enact those. So these two aspects for thinking about teaching and learning practices associated with global citizenship. First, we need it to be modelled. We need it to be modelled by everybody, but particularly by the teachers in the classrooms. And the second is for teachers and for the community more broadly to understand how you can deconstruct very complex concepts in ways that they are more amenable to use by young people. So going back to that point I made a few moments ago, this issue about urgency. I think that we can see that there are different ways of integrating the competencies that we want to see young people demonstrate. I think we can acknowledge the, the actual content knowledge that is specific to each of those education movements can be integrated into subject specific areas. But what shifts an individual 
from being competent to doing something. And that's been something very much on my mind, and I would imagine it's on many people's mind. We see such terrible things happening, we talk about the need to do something, but getting that, that trigger doesn't work so well. And so I've been thinking about all of these intrinsic and as well as extrinsic factors that might enable action. But then of course, I listened this morning to Pat Dolan and to Professor Lee, and one of the solutions, I think, that they are proposing is that it's empathy, that empathy might help us to trigger action. So let's hope that that's the case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. So maybe one way to think about uh, what Esther has um, shared with us is that perhaps one of the goals of unpacking or deconstructing global citizenship education as a concept is to be able to identify certain aspects that are shared or certain core competencies within that idea. And I think also from the example that she provided, the, sh the core, that, that core or that area that might be shared may be region specific, may be something that isn't universal necessarily, but rather shared uh, amongst a group of countries uh, in a particular region. And the reason I emphasize that because our next speaker, uh, Kaylin Roos, who's currently director of the Inter uh, Cultural Institute in uh, Timisoara, uh, Romania, and is also an associate professor at uh, the West University in the same city. For the last 25 years, he has been uh, very intimately involved in various projects and activities of the Council of Europe related to intercultural education, education for democratic citizenship and human rights education. And he was a very important member of the Council of Europe's creation of something known as the Reference Framework of Competencies for Democratic Culture. And so he uh, brings experience as a researcher, as somebody who has been teaching, uh, training teachers uh, and teacher educators, and also developing materials and other uh, curricular uh, reforms in this area, uh, in part based on this reference framework that he'll be uh, presenting uh, uh, to us here in a talk that is called The Reference Framework of Competencies for Democratic Culture and global citizenship competencies. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here and present this work of the Council of Europe in which I had the chance of being involved for several years and uh, that still continues. Um, and it is uh, uh, based on um, a process that I will try to describe in uh, the first part of my intervention and make some comments about uh, some key elements of this reference framework of uh, competencies for democratic culture. Then I uh, will spend a few minutes explaining and arguing that uh, this can be a significant, interesting contribution for on uh, the reflection on GCED and how it can be connected with GCED and with uh, SDG, uh, especially 4.7. And then I will also um, say a few words about how it can be or how it is currently operationalized in different countries in Europe. Um, so yes, this is the core part that you, what you see on the screen, the core part of the reference framework of competencies for democratic culture, a model of competence that actually looks like something like the word cloud that uh, Professor Kerr just presented uh, from um, um, the curriculum analysis in uh, some countries in Africa combined with uh, some of the interventions of Professor Dolan and Professor Lee before and organized uh, in a way that I think is compatible with uh, um, the ideas that were shared also by the previous speakers. This was in fact the first model of competence as far as uh, I know that has uh, recognized 
values as a component of um, uh, competence. Um, and then it had an impact on other um, reflections on competences um, in, uh, in different other settings. Uh, whether values are seen separately or combined with attitudes, that's, that can be discussed. But here we have values um, really uh, clearly distinguished uh, from the attitudes. Um, we also have, as you can see in this uh, model of competence, um, the knowledge part, uh, but it's not knowledge by itself. And this, I think, uh, joins what uh, Professor Kea just said, that we do not actually need an accumulation of knowledge, especially uh, in our situation today where access to knowledge is uh, really uh, uh, something that everybody has. But what we actually need is knowledge combined with critical understanding so that we make sense of the knowledge, so that we connect knowledge and we make um, different types of connections between knowledge and reality. Um, and in order to get to this uh, critical understanding of the knowledge, we of course need critical thinking skills and related intellectual skills, but we also need autonomous learning skills so that we continue to learn and process uh, and understand the information, the knowledge that we um, get and what is happening around us in society. Um, as you can see, we have also empathy uh, as part of this model and it's in the part of the skills we do understand it like every other concept here uh, is these, these are this is clearly defined in the publications of the Council of Europe we understand empathy as a skill as an ability to put yourself in the perspective of the other understand the perspectives of the others what they feel what they think um, and uh, we also have uh, a certain number of attitudes that were also, you know, some of them already mentioned, that um, uh, are very important when we speak about uh, um, this, this topic of uh, um, uh, living together in a society uh, where we have uh, respect for human rights and uh, uh, the principles of democracy, but also, uh, as you can see in the section of value, uh, we, we also appreciate cultural diversity and uh, uh, we have uh, um, as well uh, concern for equality and equity be between every human being. Um, then uh, uh, there are many other things, many other comments that can be made um, about uh, this model, but I will just emphasize for now these, these elements. And I will say a few uh, more things uh, when arguing for the connection between this and the GCED. But I want to add also the fact that this model is just the core of the reference framework. Before. Besides the, this uh, model of competence, we also have in the reference framework a specific uh, and, and uh, uh, statistically validated competence descriptors. For each of these 20 elements, we have a list of observable behaviors, so kind of outputs, uh, like uh, Professor Kea presented, um, that illustrate that a person uh, possesses a certain degree, a certain level, of proficiency in any of these elements. There were, there were a lot of discussions on whether it's possible uh, to have such, a, such descriptors of competence for values and for attitudes, but it seems that it's possible. We've argued for, for this and we're ready to share the, the data we, we have to anybody who, who wants it. Besides the descriptors and the model of competence, we also have, of course, the conceptual uh, part in which we clarify the concept of democratic culture, which we understand, uh, the Council of Europe understands as uh, um, a society in which democratic processes are embedded in the life, ev in everyday life, in which there is not only uh, democratic institutions and laws, but it's also a way of living uh, and uh, involvement of citizens um, in uh, democratic life. Um, and of course, we have also a practical part, which is uh, including uh, several um, ideas, suggestions, and examples of how the model of competence and the descriptors can be used um, in practice um, in different uh, areas of education, from training of teachers uh, uh, to uh, teaching practice and to the use in addressing specific uh, situations, uh, challenging situations that we 
uh, face in the school and in the society. Um, as you can see also, we have um, uh, a very important element uh, that connects to what Professor Lee said earlier, a knowledge and critical understanding of the self, uh, we call it. Uh, so this means also reflecting of who we are and we argue that we are many things. We don't have to make choices, uh, but we should be aware of uh, how uh, different um, groups that we belong to uh, combine in making what we are. Um, and um, we also uh, have um, uh, a lot of aspects that, uh, that are related to communication and interaction and cooperation and management of conflict, that you, as you can see in the model. Um, one thing I want to underline is that um, these are seen as all of them being components of something that we want to achieve, we, we need in society and we want to achieve in school. Uh, the Council of Europe argues that these are elements that education systems should consider as a key part of the, their mission. And this has been acknowledged also by the ministers of education uh, of the all the countries in Europe, uh, first when the model was first published in 2016, and uh, the most recently, uh, again, just a few days ago, and when we had the conference of the ministers of education in Europe uh, at the end of September in Strasbourg. So it is something that has been built uh, in a way that, um, 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 uh, not as a theoretical model, not as something that has been deducted from uh, theory, but uh, as uh, something that resulted from the analysis of over 100 models of competencies that were unpacked and that were uh, 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 then reconstructed uh, into this model. So this is uh, actually building on the theoretical and empirical studies of many researchers uh, in different parts of the world, not just in Europe, and uh, this was the result. Now, I want to argue um, about uh, uh, the connections between uh, this model and GCED and the uh, uh, target uh, 4.7. Um, and there are many uh, comments that we can make and you can see mentions of cultural diversity, of uh, peace and non-violence in relation to conflict resolution, uh, we, and also s uh, some other uh, aspects in terms of, of content. Um, and I would like to um, emphasize the uh, connection that can be made with uh, respect to this attitude that is part of the model that is called civic mindedness. And this um, refers to the attitude that we have towards others, not looking only at our own interests, but considering uh, the interest and the benefit of what other people beyond us. And that is not related to any kind of specific level, but it includes all levels, from the village level that was mentioned to the global community. And this is very important in the framework, this emphasis on uh, belonging to humanity as a global community and uh, having civic mindedness um, towards uh, the global community. This is also connected with the knowledge and critical understanding. We see mention explicitly of sustainability, for example, um, and there is an ongoing process now that was validated uh, at this conference that I mentioned uh, a few days ago uh, that the Council of Europe would further develop the connection between this model of competencies and education for sustainable development, which is already there, but it's not so uh, explicit. And um, uh, there are also um, other connections that can be made uh, with res respect to uh, the, the values uh, also that, that were mentioned and uh, some of the attitudes. Um, I um, want to then take a few minutes to say about uh, the use of this model and this framework in uh, Europe. We already have uh, different experiences in different countries from very small countries to really large countries in Europe that have used um, this uh, framework to make changes in the curriculum, similar to what we already heard in some previous presentations, um, and uh, also uh, use them in a practical way to design learning activities, to um, train teachers, um, and also uh, improve assessment. 
because assessment is a challenging uh, task when it comes to this kind of uh, combination of values, attitudes and skills and, and critical understanding. And the bank of descriptors that we have and the methodology that has been developed around that um, can be a useful tool in uh, the developing uh, uh, effective and also um, adequate, I would say, uh, ethical assessment. Uh, and uh, to end, uh, I would like to underline that the Council of Europe is proposing this to be seen not just as an individual uh, subject-based aspect, so we don't need another subject in the school dealing with these. Some of these are part already of many uh, curriculum subjects in every education system. Some of them are not. They are not usually considered as uh, necessary or uh, appropriate for curriculum uh, aims, uh, but they are. And um, uh, the Council of Europe is proposing that this should be a, a whole school approach, so that we would see an explicit focus on developing these elements of competence throughout the school activities. What is being done in every school subject, uh, in cross-curricular uh, activities, in extracurricular activities, and embedded also in the different aspects of the life of the, of the school, including, uh, for example, commitments of the school to promote sustainability, um, awareness of uh, uh, issues around uh, uh, sustainability or other global issues. Um, there are many other things that, uh, that could be uh, added about uh, the framework. Uh, some of the practical um, applications I will also mention in the concurrent session including some that are done uh, in my country or uh, that my organization, is, uh, Intercultural Institute, is promoting in, in uh, different European projects. Um, but I would like to conclude with uh, uh, just uh, one comment about the putting these elements in practice. Um, to refer back to what Professor Dolan said uh, previously, uh, empathy is important, uh, other things are also important, so how do we uh, uh, pass this message to the teachers. Um, and in the approach that the Council of Europe is promoting, it's not about having 20 things more besides what we are already doing, but to design curriculum um, elements and learning activities that um, generate opportunities for students to develop different clusters, different combinations of these elements of competence. And we have proofs and we have uh, examples of very interesting uh, and uh, effective learning activities that uh, can stimulate learners to, um, to connect to the values and to develop their attitudes, their skills, and then their critical understanding, and also accumulate knowledge that makes sense for them and for, for the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Roos. So one of the things that uh, emerges from his presentation is that uh, the European community has a very ambitious project, which is not simply to capture and reflect the diversity of approaches that are taking place in each of the national education systems, but to create something that is more regional, where there's some buy-in uh, at the regional level uh, that captures uh, certain commonalities. And clearly, uh, although he probably didn't have a chance to expound upon this, this involves a fairly prolonged political process of consultations, of uh, literature reviews, of uh, discussions. And um, I raise this issue only to juxtapose it in the way in which we've opened the conference uh, around the concept of global citizenship education, speaking to the moment of the urgent crises that education systems are being asked to uh, address and posing potentially the difficulty of engaging in prolonged political uh, consultations when urgency is, as it were, uh, the byword or the keyword here. Um, I just bring it out as, a, as an issue here. As we move to our third speaker, who will now 
I think, uh, represent perhaps one of the most diverse regions of the world, uh, Asia Pacific, whether it be in terms of demography or religion or ethnicity or language or political experiences. Um, there's absolutely no doubt that the Asia Pacific region has a level of diversity perhaps unlike any other region in the world. And part of, I think, the, um, uh, you know, the, the value added that uh, uh, Professor Lee Monsoon will provide is thinking about these uh, in some analytical fashion. Is it possible to create an understanding of global citizenship competence in such a diverse and very interesting region of the world? So Professor Bo uh, Lee Monsoon is a professor of educational policy here in uh, the Republic of Korea in Yonsei University. Uh, he has held appointments at the University of Canberra and the University of Hong Kong. Much of his uh, research focuses on cross-national comparisons of educational policy and practice. He's published extensively, more than 100 papers in these areas, and he's been recognized by various international scholarly communities for his work. Um, we're delighted to invite him to speak about mapping the emerging landscape of global citizenship education research in Asia Pacific, implications for transformative learning. The floor is yours. Thanks for the... Uh, thanks for the introduction. My name is Mu Song Lee from Yonsei University here in South Korea. Uh, truth to be told, I feel obliged to say that this is my first presentation about global citizenship education. Um, by training, I'm a comparative education researcher with a focus on education administration. So given my academic background, um, currently I don't feel the heavy burden of having to be an expert on this topic. Instead, I feel a little bit comfortable with the lightness of being a beginner on this topic, which I'm going to talk about for the next 15 minutes. Of course, you know, you know, experts were once beginners too, right? Uh, <laughs> and they probably felt just as clueless as I do now, <laughs> except uh, I have you know, a little bit fancy PowerPoint presentation here, though. Okay, let me move on. My presentation aims to map the emerging landscape of research on GSET competencies conducted in the Asia-Pacific region. So the key research question uh, that was, uh, what are the distinctive features of research on GSET competencies in this region? So to do that, I conducted a review of 36 studies, including um, mostly peer-reviewed articles uh, related to global citizenship education. So um, here's the conceptual framework uh, that I developed for this study. Um, the horizontal axis represented multiple, multi-centered locals as the agent of articulate, uh, that articulate and practice GSET. So this signifies that discourses, all ideas or global citizenship have manifested in diverse regions. For example, even the idea of global citizenship in Europe is considered not as universal articulations of global citizenship, but rather as one regional articulation, a part of the articulation by multiple regions. So taking this awareness into account, on the left of this axis, I position the Western world, and the, on the right, the Asia Pacific region. In between this continuum, various other regions can be placed. Uh, of course, you know, Asia Pacific itself is not a homogeneous monolithic entity, but just for simplify a presentation, I put this way. Now, the vertical axis represents a continuum of global citizenship as institutionalized forms, such as competencies, which are placed at the top, and the global citizenship as abstract ideas or discourses which are placed at the bottom. The top signifies GSET competencies that are being institutionalized. So specifically here, being institutionalized means creating and implementing specific rules and procedures 
to endorse a specific idea in formal organizational situation. That is, institutionalizing global citizenship as competencies means incorporating that into a formal education system or curricula, if you like, where it is practiced, assessed, and measured as competencies in education organization. The bottom of the vertical axis represents global citizenship as abstract forms, such as philosophical ideas or discourses. So, the quadrants resulting from this intersection of two axes convey the following meaning. Uh, quadrant number one presents GSET curricula and educational practices at the national or regional level across different regions uh, in, in Asia Pacific. And likewise, quadrant two represents similar things across the Western world. So more importantly, in this uh, quadrant, quadrant two also represents discourses and frameworks on GSET, which are predominantly led by major international organizations and some major nonprofit organizations. They are mainly rooted in the Western world, such as UNESCO, OECD, EU, Oxfam, and international baccalaureate organization. So basically, these organizations have consolidated and translated discourses on global citizenship competencies into their conceptual framework or matrix of GSET. And then quadrant three and four represent the global citizenship discourse inherent in the Western and the Asia Pacific indigenous ideas respectively. So there are several conceptual terms that literally represent the relationship between the quadrants. They are indicated as arrows in this framework. The first arrow adaptation represents a number of studies that I reviewed uh, basically, that uh, those studies uh, critically capture the adaptation of GSET from quadrant two to quadrant one. These studies highlight certain issues, specifically when much of the discourses and practices of GSET in the Asia Pacific region is locally adapted from those of IGOs and NGOs. So I use the term adaptation here to describe this phenomenon. And this adaptation could be called localization, if you like, that adapts contents to fit into local history and context, which could be seen as positive aspects of adaptation. However, at the same time, adaptation can also have a negative features when it involves just mere copying, just mentioning international organizations' indicators in their framework or practices in GSET. Or it is used reactively for the legitimacy of domestic policy in some countries. So in these processes, sometimes pretty excessive modifications and editing can distort the original meaning, which could be seen as appropriation. And the second arrow includes research that presents the possibility of reverse adaptation from quadrant four to quadrant one and then quadrant two. These studies differ from the mainstream discourse by showing discussion on indigenous global citizenship in the Asia Pacific. The blue arrows here encompasses a body of research that navigates the origins of indigenous ideas and concepts that currently inform the discourses on GSET competencies. This line of research aims to connect quadrant four to quadrant one. I guess there are also numerous studies that explore con the connection between quadrant three and quadrant two, indicated in the yellow arrow. Another yellow arrow shows the line of research that I reviewed, basically saying that interfaces or dialectics between quadrant three and quadrant four. These studies basically attempt to find connections between global citizenship thinking in the Asia Pacific region and Western philosophy of cosmopolitanism. Of course, I'm conscious of time, so uh, I'll focus on adaptation and reverse adaptation in this presentation. So here are my reflections based on my literature review. The number one, the studies falling under this category of adaptation raise concerns about simple adoption or consumption of GSET driven by Western-based IGOs. 
Also, some studies were concerned about excessive adaptation, including like nationalist tint in GZ in some countries. This case might be seen as appropriation. So consequently, there might be an issue of double adaptation, which I call. If we accept Mignolo's argument, he is saying that basically today's discourse on global citizenship is pretty rooted in the West. If this assertion is accepted, then contemporary discourse on global citizenship and related narratives may have their origins in the West, tracing back temporarily to ancient Greece and conceptually to Western modernity, which could be or which would be a form of re-Westernization. Re so from this perspective, uh, negative aspects of adaptation can potentially extend to the broader issue of double adaptation. I reckon the study categorized within the reverse adaptation can offer a critical perspective on the institution, institutionalization process of G said within dominant discourse, often led by IGOS once again. For example, a case study from Philippines where political democracy is not firmly established and social economic inequality is pervasive. This study demonstrates how G said can provide students with open, safe, and vibrant spaces for critical discussing controversial social and political issues. The study highlights the importance of GSET in providing students with the tools and spaces to critically engage with contentious issues, fostering critical thinking and action. So I reckon this is a real world example that illustrated the idea of how transformative learning of students contribute to macro level goals like social justice. This suggests that global citizenship should not be reduced to a narrow set of competencies, mostly provided by major international organizations or provided by external agencies. So in summary, what I'm saying here is the studies categorized within reverse adaptation question, what competencies are needed in this region and how they should be defined and incorporated in the regional context. Another reflection I want to share is there was a number of studies seeking the origins of global citizenship idea in indigenous thought in the region. There is a bit of a radicality in this line of research because uh, these studies implies whether global citizenship should be conceptualized as competencies. These studies basically uh, see global citizenship as more than competencies. For example, global citizenship is characterized as virtue, character, moral qualities, spirituality, etc. So, of course, understanding global citizenship as competencies is in and of itself beneficial. I agree, uh, given that it is an effective way to institutionalize global citizenship in our school curriculum and system. However, I guess especially when trying to conceptualize GSAT, as some, something transformative, this indigenous thought could be valuable sources for thought experiments. Final reflection is, there is no unified perspective or educational practice of Asia Pacific global citizenship. This diversity arises from the multitude of voices and cultural backgrounds that share the discourse and educational practices related to GSET. So while there is a certain degree of convergence with international organizations' perspective, I also witness area of divergence from my re literature review. So the discourse and educational practices in the Asia Pacific region are multi-centered with multiple voices. Conclusion, the title of this year's international conference on global citizenship education is Unpacking GSET, as you know, and transfer, Transformative Learning for Critical Empowerment. Some people might perceive the adjectives and nouns used in the conference title as mere rhetoric devoid of attention. However, 
in light of events in Israel and Palestine over the last few days, I couldn't help but think that the title of this international conference contained a sense of urgency. So while preparing my presentation, I have contemplated the vocabulary transformative. The objective, sorry, the adjective transformative implies substantial and substantive changes, not just mere improvement. To be literal, I would say transform means to change form. Here form represents certain state of existence. And trans signifies the movement between various forms. In essence, moving between different forms of existence may refer to as seeking most suitable or relevant forms within the diversity. In this regard, I believe that unpacking GSET for transformative learning is about discovering the most relevant forms of GSET within the diverse Asia-Pacific context. While Western-centric or more specifically international organizations driven global, sort of global grammar of GSET competencies may certainly have universal values. I'll give you that. But I also think that seeking diverse regional universes of global citizenship is transformative in and of itself. Final slide. I'm conscious of time. <laughs> Indigenous thinking in the Asia Pacific region points out that education has been trapped for too long in a materialistic, growth-oriented paradigm. For instance, the indigenous thinking of Pacific Island communities, such as concept of Pacifica, that concept challenges Western conception of the individual. While Western educational philosophy and policy policies in general assumed learners as fundamentally autonomous and self-directed individual. However, the concept of Pacifica challenges this notion by highlighting that the concept of individual itself is not clear cut. Instead, what matters to Pacifica learners is understanding how they are positioned in time and space connected to the past, present, and the future. And this view resonates with the advocating for education to be redefined as a community endeavor rather than an individual achievement. I believe that when such indigenous ways of thinking coexist in a multi-centering manner, we can move toward transformative learning for critical empowerment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee. Very uh, interesting thoughts that has uh, provided. Um, we now have, I guess, about 15, 17 minutes for questions and discussion. Um, and I invite both the audience here uh, uh, in person and also those that are online to uh, write down your questions for particular presenters or for the panel uh, generally. And we will try to ask as many as we possibly can. While we're waiting for those questions to come in, um, allow me, and I give, I do apologize to the organizers because I'm going to ask a question that I had not posed uh, prior, but I do think that it is uh, a, p a question that I think is important. Um, as we know, Target 4.7, which encapsulates uh, the international legitimacy around both Education for Sustainable Development and Global Citizenship Education speaks about all learners, not just learners in formal education and in school. It speaks about transforming knowledge and skills for all learners. And almost all the presentations that we've heard thus far uh, at this conference have focused almost exclusively on the ways in which global citizenship education should be understood uh, and analyzed and implemented and potentially assessed primarily among learners in schools, whether it be uh, primary, secondary education and potentially even higher education. 
to what extent, and this is my question, are the models that you have been promoting, advancing, or understand in this area of global citizenship, do you see them as equally relevant and applicable to adult learners, to those who are no longer in the formal education system, that are engaged in more non-formal and informal learning experiences? And I underscore this also to think about the issue of urgency and transformation, because many people would argue that given the scope and multiple crises that we're experiencing, focusing only on the younger generation today, while important, um, doesn't give justice or, in other words, it squanders the opportunity to also transform learners who are no longer in school, who are part of older generations. Um, so I'd like to ask each of the panelists maybe to give a brief uh, response to that question. Thank you, Aaron. My thoughts immediately go to the work that's being completed uh, in Uganda, Tanzania and, um, and Kenya. So just over two years ago, those countries got together because they wanted to understand what the levels of proficiencies were of young people throughout the countries, both those in school and out of school. And the first step that the countries took was to try to understand what some of the related concepts, how they would be understood by communities. And so there was a huge contextualization study undertaken on a number of different constructs. They included things like problem solving, self-awareness, respect, collaboration. And they drew definitions and understandings from rural and urban areas, from parents, from teachers, from um, village leaders, and from adolescents, in order to try to understand what their understandings of these concepts were. So we're not talking specifically about global citizenship here, but about those competencies that contribute to things like global citizenship. And then based on those contextualised understandings, the countries then put together some assessment tools to try to work out what the competencies of young 13 to 17 year old adolescents were across the three countries. And so since that time, there's been 45,000 young people assessed in villages through household-based assessment. I think, and, and then that information then is used as data to inform um, non-government organisations as well as the education systems across each of those countries. So it's a very good example of the fact that people are concerned about exactly what you mentioned. So it's not only about whether it's in school or out of school, it's about what is understood in a local community or in a region or in a country about understandings of skills. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, in uh, my case, the answer is simple. The reference framework of the Council of Europe um, emphasizes that it is equally valid for all learners, regardless of age or, or education sit setting. Of course, it, how it's done, it's different, has to be adapted to age or to different other aspects. We do have also a separate set of uh, descriptors for children for under uh, the age of 10, but uh, all the other things, um, remain valid from my perspective, yeah. Professor Lee? Right, I guess my uh, answer would be also simple. You know, obviously education occurs not just in school, but also it just happens throughout our lives. It's, a, it's pretty true that lifelong learning is always you know, around us. So, but the reason we are focusing on global citizenship uh, at the uh, K-12 level, if I say, the reason is because we could institutionalize global citizenship as sort of a tangible forms uh, using our curriculum and assessment system. That is what, that's why we are focusing on that. But at the same time, I believe, you know, same types or similar types of competence that should be also applied to other populations or people like an informal or non-formal context, definitely. So in that sense, I believe uh, shifting focus from individual, just 
K-12 students to more collective actors could possibly broaden uh, the processes and perspectives and outcomes of GSET potentially. So in that sense, that is a pretty, I think, one, one of the directions we could think of is if we really want to uh, develop this idea to larger populations. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I think this uh, partly speaks to uh, this idea, um, the distinction between a whole institutional approach, which primarily focuses on schools or educational organizations, versus a whole community or a whole society approach, which would uh, see uh, the various kinds of interventions by either government or non-governmental actors as developing potential synergies uh, in this area. Uh, again, speaking to the question of urgency, uh, that only by mobilizing many different leaders and actors within a community could you expect to bring about some fundamental uh, transformative changes uh, beyond the, the, the status quo. Um, I wonder if we have uh, questions that have come up from the floor that we'd also like to ask uh, at this point. I mean, I have a list of other questions that I could ask, but I certainly want to give um, other uh, participants a chance. Thank you very much. Okay. Here's a question to Professor Lee. Based on everything shared, does it mean that IGOs, the international government organizations and non-governmental organizations, so should, should develop one framework, including all those different views, or several frameworks based on regional realities and needs? Mm. Wow, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> we're, we're, we're trying to get good questions up here. <laughs> all right, uh, yeah, a little bit daunting to answer quickly though. Um, I reckon some G said competencies uh, may have universal values and, and principles, definitely. But my argument was that should be adapted and contextualized to different uh, groups of people based on their language and religion, etc. So uh, I would say on the one hand, there are certain core values and principles of GSET that could be broadly applicable. And then we, we should pursue that sort of more universal principles or values in relation to GSET. Uh, at the same time, what I'm saying here would be different uh, communities and different cultures, they have unique world views and our own you know, way of thinking. And then respecting and learning from their unique indigenous thinking would be another way to enrich our understanding of what you said. That was my point. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I have two more questions here and they perfectly, I have one for Professor Kerr and one for uh, Professor Roos. Um, Esther, you've been asked, focusing on the enabling outputs through transformative education, is there a rethinking on assessment framework in this case? Are the three countries in East Africa designing suitable assessment as part of their curricular transformation? Right up your alley. You, this is a vexed <laughs> question, a, a mischievous question. Somebody, you must have paid somebody in the audience <laughs> to ask it. <laughs> um, so I need to put my personal perspectives aside from my professional ones sometimes. We know that many countries see a great need to assess summatively. And we also know that many countries are increasingly want to assess formatively. And from my own perspective, formative assessment makes every single little piece of sense because it's a pedagogical strategy and it's geared to help students to learn. Unfortunately, the the degree of knowledge and familiarity that 
teachers have both with assessment, i.e. assessment literacy, and with the nature of the competencies that lead to global citizenship is not well developed. And I'm aware that countries all over the world are concerned about the fact that they're introducing things into their curriculum that their teachers are not familiar with, and that in some countries, a pre-service teacher education is trying to increase both assessment literacy as well as bring these new concepts into curriculum. But in the meantime, we have um, assessment groups and examinations councils in many countries who need to, who believe that they need to show that there are particular standards in terms of these competencies and that the students have met those standards. And so what that means in turn is that some of those councils or groups are attempting to assess these competencies in the same way as they may have been assessing content knowledge for many years. And that is not going to lead to a good place. And so I think we're a little bit out of, out of sync in terms of the needs and the amount of assessment literacy behind it. And to answer the question shortly though, yes, those countries are interested in assessment, but they vary. So Uganda, for example, is quite interested in really pushing the formative assessment approach with these competencies, whereas in one of the other countries, you find that that's a little bit different. Thank you. Thanks very much. So here we have a question for Director Roos. Democratic culture, competencies, and all uh, values, attitudes, skills, knowledge, and critical understanding are related to the practical basis. Behavioral part, the behavioral part is very important. How are these competencies uh, linked to the technology, such as ICT, as a pedagogical means in, teaching, in the teaching learning process? What are the strategies uh, to make these competencies practical through the use of ICT? Um, yes, great question, of course. Um, we can look at it in two ways. Well, one way is very easy. Uh, ICT can be a very valuable tool for, de for designing um, learning activities and learning environments that develop these competencies. Um, these elements of competence are the same that are needed in real life and in online life. And young people today live in both. Uh, so we need to do both. And the Council of Europe has a, a specific program called the Digital Citizenship Education Program, which is based on this framework and which aims exactly as at uh, uh, supporting education systems and teachers in this endeavor to uh, use this uh, the online environment to develop these competencies, but also to um, have... Uh, uh, processes of learning uh, about how these competencies are to be used in online life. Thank you very much. So I would like to wrap up this session by indicating that, um, uh, you know, one of the nice things about being asked to unpack the concept of global citizenship competencies that we don't necessarily have to reassemble and provide concrete solutions, although many concrete solutions were formulated here. So partly I think the goal of this session is to get us to think more critically about some of the concepts that uh, are being used uh, to understand uh, the very different contexts in which they're being applied and to see potential synergies across settings, not to think of every setting as being idiosyncratic and uh, inherently unique, but also that there are shared concerns and potentially things that emerge uh, as uh, common uh, uh, interests. So I think with that, I'd like to thank each of the uh, three panelists for very wonderful presentations. Um, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Professor Kerr, Professor Lee, and uh, Director Roos. Thank you very much.